Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage. If this is the first time you're stopping by the channel, there's a playlist of our entire third season of LFF. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, we're gonna be here and we're gonna be chatting about something large format photography. In continuing with what we were talking about last week, which was organizing our large format process, we've already notched some holders, talked about some good notes. Today, we're getting right down to it with film testing. Now, there's a few ways to go about the film testing procedure, uh, but one of my favorites that's pretty easy to do if you've got a few hours of spare time is the method by one Mr. Bond, Alex Bond. Let's head over and check it out. So before we get too far, why would we need to test our film? In addition to not having worked too much with this Delta 100, the tools, developers, and everything else along the way that I use are gonna differ very slightly from every other photographer out there. That's why it's important to determine your own personal film speed. And we can do this through testing. If you go by Ansel Adams' testing procedures, which he outlines in book two of his trilogy, The Negative, back in appendix one, you would need upwards of 12 sheets of four x five film to complete the test. In addition to that, you would need one of these big monsters right here. This is a transmission densitometer. That super chunky thing is for measuring a very, very small area of the negative to see how much light is permitted through. The denser the areas of the negative, uh, the higher the value it's gonna return, giving us a higher density. Lower areas, or the film rebate, are gonna have almost no density whatsoever. And we can record those values and map them out on a little light. Uh, math, why you gotta come in here and ruin this whole thing? We're trying to have fun with our photography. Well, if we don't wanna go to the, the full, full bore, uh, getting a densitometer, mapping things out, charts, graphs, all that, we can go a little bit simpler. A few years ago, I stumbled on an article from Australian photographer Alex Bond, and he's substituting all those extra sheets of film and a densitometer with one of these, which is a 21-step Stouffer wedge. This is a piece of 4x5 size film with 21 steps. Each of these steps progresses in a half-stop density or a half-zone density along the way, from nearly transparent all the way to nearly opaque. By overlaying this on top of a sheet of film in the 4x5 film holder, we're able to against a white surface we photograph, give ourselves a negative that represents the whole tonal scale or the whole zone scale uh, when we're doing our photography. This will give us great information to tell us if the film speed that we're currently using with the film we're testing is too high, too low, or just right. And this is again gonna be based on the developer that we use, the age of our equipment, and just all those other small little factors of doing the dance that add up along the way. To get started, we're gonna need one of these Stouffer 21-step wedges, which is way less expensive than a transmission densitometer. We're gonna need our film. We're gonna need our film holders. If you followed with last week's episode, hopefully you have some notched film holders so you can keep track. We're gonna need a notepad and a pen so we can keep track of things along the way. I'm gonna note the holder, the exposure, and the ISO that I rate the film at. And we're going to need a target, something to photograph. In the case of the Bond method, we're gonna need a white poster board or this piece of spare mat board. The reason we're using white is we're shooting outside. Uh, it's really effective to test on a really nice bright sunny day, barely any clouds in the sky. This is about as close as we're gonna get here in Ohio. So I'm gonna mount this up in this north light shadow that I have going on here. If you're in the northern hemisphere, the northern part of any building is gonna cast a long shadow uh, where you can mount this, uh, this whole testing setup to get good even light. Okay, so we've got our white card set up right here in our indirect light. Now let's get the camera set up. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is put on a lens that has relatively even fall off. This means no super wide angle or super telephoto lenses. Something in the standard focal length range is gonna do great. So I'm using my Schneider 355G Claron. Since I'm using my reducing back, this is a little bit long for four x five, but this lens has insane coverage. So I'm not worried at all about the evenness of that four x five patch that I'm exposing. So we're gonna move the camera in a little bit closer so this smaller target fills the whole frame of that four x five area on my ground glass. Another kind of weird thing, but it's necessary for the test, is we're gonna focus our lens to infinity. We don't actually want to try and focus this. 
One, because it's an even surface and that'd be hard to do. But two, we don't care. We actually don't want any of that texture that might be coming. So that's why it's also important to use something relatively smooth. So we've got the camera set up. We have our exposure target, lens focused to infinity. Our film is loaded up. One extra thing about loading up those film, you wanna take good care uh, and use some gloves when you're loading that up. And for reasons we're going to talk about later, you also want something opaque over top that Stouffer wedge. Alex recommends in his blog post little stickers that can come on and off. That's just going to provide enough difference in density between the step 21 or zone 10 and completely, completely opaque, just in case we're under on our ISO estimate. For metering, get a meter that you trust and has a pretty good degree of accuracy. I'm going to go with the old reliable you might have seen here on the channel before, which is my Siconic L778. I could perform this test with the Raveni Spot, but I've had this one for nearly a decade, and I know it like the back of my hand, and this one reads in tenth stop increments versus the Raveni in third stop increments. You want to iron out each and every one of those variables and go through them. Tenth stop increments are going to remove any doubt. So I'm going to start at 50 and see if my equipment varies higher or lower from there. On my Schneider lens here, this wide open is F9. I don't want to use any half f-stops, I'll just use a whole f-stop. So the nearest whole f-stop on this lens is F11. And at F11, I'm at a 15th of a second for my exposure target. But that's for middle gray. I need to bump up my exposure by five f-stops to get to uh, the zone 10 exposure that I'm going to need for my test. So with my metering complete in this diffused light, to get that zone 10 exposure with ISO 50, my metered time is one second. Uh-oh, one second with Ilford Delta 100 isn't quite one second. One second is two seconds. That's due to reciprocity failure. That means we're gonna set our camera for two seconds, ISO 50, F11. I've got my Stouffer wedge already lined up in holder number seven. We're gonna drop it in. Uh, oh, as far as exposure goes, this lens doesn't have two seconds on it, but it does have one second. Since nothing's gonna be moving, we're on the tripod, I'm just gonna do two one second exposures back to back. That's gonna be far more accurate than any amount of counting because uh, one day's counting might be faster, one day's might be slower. We gotta isolate these variables and get control over them. Holders in, great, everything's locked down, lens is cocked, exposure one, exposure two, all right, let's do another one just for good measure. So now I've got our second exposure loaded up in holder eight. This time we're gonna put it in for ISO 100. So I'm gonna develop two sheets at the same time, make this a little bit more efficient. In our holder, great. And this is kind of weird. We are a half second, not a whole second. A half second, we don't have reciprocity. One second, we do. So we're kind of jumping from a half second to two seconds. Hopefully there's not too much variance because of that. So the next thing we have to do is go into the darkroom and develop these out. When you're developing, you want to use a developer that you already know pretty well. Uh, if you don't have that much good working experience with it, you might want to try something you have used before, or at least one where there's plenty of documentation of that film combination, because you want to develop it for a normal amount of time. There are other ways to further refine what your normal developing time is, but start with the published ones. For me, in Pyrocat HD, that means 12 minutes in 20 degrees Celsius using trays. I wanted to take a moment here in the middle of the video to give a special thank you to all of our LFF sustaining members. Uh, you can find out more about LFF memberships at mirage.com memberships. If you are a sustaining member at the $5 and up level, I just made a big trip to the post office yesterday, so in the coming weeks you should be seeing your thank you cards. And for those that tuned in and became a member during my special live stream earlier this month, you'll see a little strudel print in there as well. So thank you. So in addition to the two sheets that we exposed with the Stouffer wedge, we're going to take one additional blank sheet to establish what's known as film base plus fog. This is unexposed, but the presence of the developer and all the different steps of processing should give us a negative with slightly more density than if there was no development at all. Okay, so we just turned the lights on with our fixer. Let's take a look 
at some sheets. There is a very, very nice Stouffer wedge showing up on one. There is a very blank sheet of film. And another, another Stouffer wedge. We're looking good. So while our film is drying, I'm gonna stage some trays here because we're gonna to need to do some printing for the very last part of this process. So for our print developer, we're using Ilford Multigrade, which is gonna get diluted one plus nine. We're using some Sprint Stop, which also is gonna get diluted one plus nine. And finally, our fixer, just some Ilford Fix. Pre-diluted, out of the bottle, you go one plus five. Some things to note about the film we just developed. Our film base plus fog, there's actually quite a bit of that film base plus fog. Uh, it's definitely not transparent and that's going to add density to our, uh, to our print. We're gonna need more print time than if there wasn't a negative on top of it. This first exposure that we did rating it at ISO 50, I know this one was my ISO 50 negative because I can see my triangle and my two little notches, meaning that's five, six, seven. This is holder seven. There's a definite difference in density between my ISO 50 exposure step 21 and the little circle sticker in front of it, meaning that ISO 50 would actually really, really overexpose my film. So ISO 50, uh, we're gonna actually have to use a higher ISO. The second exposure I did that was at ISO 100 is looking quite a bit nicer. There is barely any difference between where I had the sticker and step 21, meaning my ISO was right in the ballpark. And this is actually consistent with Pyrocat HD as a developer. In traditional films like Ilford HP5 and Ilford FP4, those films tend to lose speed in Pyrocat, whereas your Delta or your T-grained emulsions like Kodak T-Max and Ilford Delta, those actually have full speed, if not a smidge more. There's a slight a bit difference between the circle and 21, meaning that I bet I could rate this at 125. For now, I'm gonna call my personal ISO on Ilford 100 and Pyrocat HD 1 to 1, ISO 125. So now that we found our working ISO for Ilford Delta 100, which is 125, we need to make a series of contact prints to determine uh, where our normal development time is. If we don't know both, we're kind of shooting in the dark back and forth. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my negative that has film base plus fog, and I'm gonna contact print that, trying to find the minimum amount of exposure time I need to achieve maximum black. So that's when I have like a test strip and I don't find any difference between uh, maybe six seconds and 10 seconds. If you don't know how to make a contact print, I'm gonna put a link up to some of my darkroom work episodes featuring contact printing. It's an important skill to know and very important as part of film testing. Since I don't need a whole eight by 10 sheet of paper to do this, I'm just gonna tear this in half. That'll give me enough room for the contact print and plenty of extra room for notes. Flip that that way. Bring it in. Okay. Another thing that's important to do is keep notes of your enlarger positions. So your enlarger height, what lens you're using, what f-stop you're using, and the times that you're using. All of these variables need to be nailed down, otherwise the test is kind of shooting in the dark. So after a few minutes of exposure, we have this little line chart here. Now this is Ilford multi-grade fiber, and uh, every few seconds I covered it with a hard line. And you can see that gradient goes really dark really quick. I went a little overkill. I went two seconds all the way up to 16 seconds up here. So we have two, four, six, eight, and it's getting a little harder to tell, but there's the line between eight seconds and 10 seconds. But after 10 seconds, I cannot see anything else. So 10 seconds 
is my minimum time for maximum black. We're done with our film base plus fog sheet of film, and now we need to bring out the one that has our effective ISO, which is our sheet that was exposed at ISO 100. I'm gonna contact print this over top that same paper for 10 seconds. All right, let's take a look and see where we're at. So the reason we did a contact print with this step wedge at our minimum time for maximum black is to show us where the contrast range of our negative is. In this case, we have good separation in values between 17 and 18 down here, which represents the zone two region all the way up through uh, the, I would say about the difference between four and five and five and six. This is the zone eight region. That represents a normal contrast range. If I had lost these highlight values earlier, that would indicate a negative that received too much development or an N plus development, which this one doesn't look like I overdeveloped it. And if these gray values extended all the way down uh, into these lower digits, two, three, and four, I may have a underdeveloped negative or an N minus one. But from the looks of things, Pyrocat HD, one part A, one part B, 100 parts water, 12 minutes, 20 degrees centigrade is giving us a normal development for Ilford Delta 100 at ISO 125. Well, three sheets of film and two sheets of fiber paper and a few hours of work later, and we have some film testing completed. This is pretty cool. The first time I tested film, I went through just short of a dozen sheets of film and I still wasn't really sure if I did it right because I was throwing so many new things in front of myself at once. I had to learn the densitometer and I'm still not entirely sure if I'm doing that right. Alex's method using the Stouffer step wedges has been excellent. Here's my finished print, by the way. I think it ended up pretty great. And with that little bit of drying time, you can see the slight differences between steps four and five and uh, the 17 and 18, so perfectly normal development time. It's worth mentioning that this whole post that I've been talking about from Alex Bond was inspired by a longer form article from Mr. Paul Wainwright, who is an excellent black and white, very traditional photographer who outlines it very well and has some other deep opinions about certain things in the photographic process. And I tend to agree with him on a lot of things, especially with the don't get too technical. When you get so caught up in the technical, you realize you're not doing the art side of photography. So that's kind of what I like about this less tools, less effort, and still pretty good reliable results using calibrated tools that already exist. I think that's my favorite thing about this. Could I have just used box speed on my film? Absolutely, but testing just gives us that extra reliability that I know when I'm using Ilford Delta 100 in my developer of choice, Pyrocat HD, with all the other variables controlled, I know what I'm going to get. If you have any questions about testing your film or other photographic materials, drop those down below in the comments. Do you test your film? Uh, what's your favorite film and developer combination? I'd love to know down below. For those long form questions, you can always feel free to shoot me an email, largeformatquestions at gmail.com. Thanks again for stopping by and we'll catch you next week for more LFF.